All right. If we're all good to go, we can we can go and get the ball rolling because Julie keeps me to really strict timing for the workshop. Uh, so let's uh, let's get balls rolling then. Uh, uh, hi everyone, those of you physically here, and hi everyone online at various time zones, including Sharon late in the evening. Uh, my name is Mikel Akut. I'm uh, associate dean for research in the faculty and director of the Melbourne Set of Cities. Um, I'm just a Gonna kick us off, uh, but this is a billion percent Julie show from uh, uh, getting the the Urban Geography Workshop Award that funds this uh, and getting the whole show together with speakers from all over the place. Um, so I'm genuinely here for pop popcorns and lollies and and, and, and listening. In. Um, before we get going, as per tradition for us, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional elders. Uh, of the lands upon which we meet, uh, which is probably a good number, not just the Wurundjeri people of the Kuli Nation here uh, um, in, the, in the Melbourne School of Design building, or Glyn Davis building on campus in Parkfield, uh, but maybe invite those uh, that are logging in online as well to reflect on their traditional owners and their relationship with traditional owners. Uh, and I think that's a quite uh, fitting as well in the conversation on creativity. Uh, in the built environment and reflecting for us here, at least in Australia and in Victoria, on one of the longest uh, traditions of creativity in building. Um, so with that, what I'm here to do is just to introduce uh, the keynote kickoff, which uh, I introduced valiantly just by first name, but Professor Sharon Zuki. Uh, but thanks, Sharon, for joining in from overseas. Uh, I don't think Sharon needs much of an introduction, uh, being a giant of urban sociology and urban studies in general. Uh, as I would hope most of you would know her from, uh, from classics like Love Living, like Naked City, uh, like the recent innovation complex, which I think foregrounds a bit the conversation today on sort of mapping and understanding uh, the tech industry and the, and, and the tech society of New York. Uh, Julie's asked um, uh, Sharon to sort of talk us through her recent work on art and real estate uh, uh, in urban redevelopment. Um, so her talk is called Who Lost Saw. Uh, formerly, Sharon is Professor Emerita of Sociology at CUNY in New York at Brooklyn College. And I'm definitely going to stop right there. Just for those in the room, uh, that's the exit. If you hear uh, an evacuate or emergency sign, evacuate i can assure you we haven't planned anything uh any trips of any sorts bathrooms and facilities are on that floor and if you need any help or any indications or anything just get in touch with anyone of us that is organizing this and we'll direct you there's points but those online sorry we can't provide you cookies and cookies and wine and, and drinks uh but we'll try and make this as convivial as possible sharon thanks a million i'll just pass it on to you and take notes Thank you, Michele, and thanks very much to Julie Miao for inviting me to uh, to share my current research project with you. Um, I'm uh, uh, I, I'm not going to assume that you've read my very first piece of urban research. That was uh, my book Loft Living, uh, that was published in 1982, and um, is still in print in the third edition. So uh, I, I'll backtrack a little bit while I speak and, uh, and, and explain what SOHO is and how it came to be what, uh, what it is. Um, I, so I did research on, um, on SOHO, an area of lower Manhattan, uh, very close to where I live back in the early 1980s when the district was just becoming extremely prominent around the world as an artist district. The buildings that you see here in the photo of me with my filmmaking partner, Alice Arnold um, in, in 2020, the buildings are typically late 19th century New York, uh, loft buildings, factory buildings, in which each floor, which could be around 200 to 1,000 square meters, uh, was devoted to some form of light manufacturing, metalworking, printing, food, uh, uh, food making. Uh, but by the time 
uh, that artists began to move into lofts in Soho, uh, a lot of the manufacturing had already left, had, had uh, gone to suburban uh, industrial sites or overseas, or, and eventually was phased out by um, digitization. Uh, and so some of these buildings were in warehouse use for basically rags and fabric scraps or hardware or some other kind of product that might not even have been manufactured any longer in this area. Um, so artists began to move into Lower Manhattan and uh, in and around this area south of Houston Street, which is why it's called Soho, in the mid to late 1960s. Um, they found these places to be really terrific, large spaces at very cheap rents maybe $50 or $100 a month for a very large empty space. But the downside was that they were living and working in an area that was zoned for manufacturing. So if they lived there, they were illegally living there and there were no building services, no city services like garbage pickup to, uh, to speak of and not many traffic lights even though the streets were filled with trucks during the day picking up from the loading docks of these buildings. Now, I returned to Soho in uh, 2020 when um, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations that followed the murder of uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis uh, brought in their wake for a few nights uh, intensive looting, it, basically all over the city and in all shopping districts, but there was intensive and apparently professional organized looting of the stores in Soho, of which by the 2010s, there were quite a few. So um, uh, I went down to see the murals that artists from all over the city came to paint on the plywood that store owners and store managers installed to protect their premises, pretty much denuded of products, but protect their premises from further um, looting and destruction. And then my research became much more directed and intense in 2021 when the Department of City Planning of New York City proposed what they called a neighborhood plan to rezone Soho, basically upzoning, allowing the construction of much taller buildings, including in some places in the historic area, protected by um, historic district and individual building designation. Those are the pink areas that the map of the city planning department is um, uh, oh, sorry, is um, uh, calling the, uh, the historic core, but in fact, there is much more, uh, there are many more historic buildings throughout the, the whole Soho area. And in the adjacent historic district of NoHo, north of Houston Street, um, uh, which you can see up here, NoHo, Soho. And uh, there are uh, other areas over here that the city planning department is causing, is calling housing opportunity areas, even though there are four, four to five story apartment houses uh, and, and tenements, it's some of which contain um, not rent controlled, but rent stabilized housing. Uh, this, uh, uh, the population of Soho and Novo is mainly white and on the average affluent for reasons that I will talk about, even though about 8,000 artists remain living in these two areas, mostly in, in Soho. This area over here uh, 
contains apartments in which uh, Chinese people, mainly working class and lower middle class, live. Over here, west of Sixth Avenue, is an area called Hudson Square, not to be confused with Hudson Yards um, up to, uh, in Midtown Manhattan. But Hudson Square, since the since the early 2010s, has gone through its own very interesting uh, redevelopment. It's become a mixed use area, formerly industrial, uh, with many printing plants in, in um, how can I say, in juxtaposition to Soho's many, um, many garment uh, factories. There were printing plants over here, but since 2010, the area has been redeveloped for tech and creative offices, including um, two build very large construction sites, one over 1 million square feet for the regional headquarters of the Disney Corporation, a, a, a media company, not just a theme park and um, movie company, but a media company over 1 million square feet and another 1 million square feet just finishing construction, which will be another office for Google. Um, before the pandemic, it was projected that Google when it would finish building this new campus, in addition to its other properties, Google would have around 14,000 engineers at work in the city. Um, half of whom would be over here. And there are also some very expensive new apartment houses that have been built over here near the tech and creative offices. So there's a great deal of pressure to, to build in this area. Um, another, sort, another center of pressure is New York University the largest private university in New York City, not to be confused with my university, the, the public university. And NYU's historic campus is, um, is around here, but over the past 50 or 60 years, they have expanded through NoHo, uh, also in Brooklyn, and they, um, they are eyeing the properties that might be made available to them. Uh, with the rezoning of SOHO uh, that was finally completed in 2021, completed after an extremely contentious year-long process of holding public meetings that, because of the pandemic, I watched assiduously on Zoom. So I hope you can, I hope you can understand why I was brought back to, uh, to Soho in 2020 and why I've been doing a series of, of interviews with people who are involved in the rezoning in one way or another. And the, my goal is to make a, a film with, uh, with Alice as well as to do a little bit of new writing. So what I've tried to, to explain in just a few words is that by 2020, Soho was thrust into the middle of a conflict between the not in my backyard uh, uh, group and the yes in my backyard group of community activists in the first place, housing activists from outside the community in the second place. The context is that New York has a chronic housing crisis and like other big cities, especially those like San Francisco, Seattle, Washington, DC, that have uh, experienced huge growth of tech jobs and tech offices in the past 20 years, uh, housing is really unaffordable by most of the people who are living here now. This chronic housing crisis uh, was compounded by the multiple crises of 2020, the public health crisis of the COVID pandemic, um, the uh, economic crisis that followed the pandemic, and the, um, the, uh, the political crisis that 
is punctuated and illustrated by ongoing calls for social justice and racial justice. In this context, Soho became a poster child for building affordable housing using the, the tool that the, uh, the two previous uh, mayoral administrations, the de Blasio administration and the Bloomberg administration had devised and um, a, 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 an area that because of the historic district designations and the special status of artists as the only people who legally had the right to live in Soho, you can see that this was just an incendiary situation. Uh, there were many actors involved in, in the rezoning conflict. Um, two groups that are particularly important, as I suggested a couple of minutes ago, are housing activists identified with, with uh, a YIMBY group in New York, who emerged uh, as a group in small numbers relatively recently in the past three years or so. And the other group is community activists who include people who live in Soho who have never been, or I should say have not been particularly active in uh, local politics or local movements since they were artists trying to get the city to legalize their living in this in this uh, district back in the 1970s. But there are other community activists who have been advocates for um, better conditions, better rents, um, just a be you know better quality of life in Soho during the past uh, 15 or 20 years. These are not the same people as the housing activists and they really don't identify as NIMBYs because they do support the building of affordable housing in, this, in their neighborhood, but not under the conditions that the Department of City Planning proposed. So the process of rezoning really started in 2015 when a couple of local political officials started to talk to, um, to artists and community activists living in Soho about how to, uh, how to modernize the zoning laws, which were made back in the 1970s, along with the original historic district designations. And they did not, the zoning laws did not take account of any of the big changes mm. that have redeveloped Soho since the 1970s. So the process kind of began with informal conversations back in 2015. It became more formal when the city planning department launched an envisioning process, which will be familiar to any of you who study or work in urban planning. Uh, and the envisioning process uh, lasted for about six months. Uh, there were a lot of very contentious uh, public meetings. That was before the pandemic in 2019 and 2020. So the public meetings occurred in person. I did not follow them because I was I was writing my tech book. And um, this was you know outside of, of what I had time to get involved in. And another uh, part of the rezoning process is very important and would require a two hour lecture on its own. This is a process uh, called uniform land use uh, review procedure. Uh, somewhat redundantly, we call it a Euler process. It's a set of New York City and New York State laws that govern any kind of change or exception to zoning laws so that the rezoning of a district as well as a, a um, what we call a variance, an exception 
to the existing zoning on an individual building. In other words, whether you're talking about rezoning a whole district or changing the use of a single building, all, all, uh, all, both of those kinds of cases and everything in between is subject to a Euler process of approvals. Um, in terms of scale, it's a series of graduated discussions and approvals starting on the local level in the local community board. New York City is divided into uh, 52 community districts, each one of which has a volunteer community board, but that community board while it is the first stage of decision making in a Euler process, it has no real power. Its decision, the community board's decision, is only advisory. After the community board weighs in on a Euler, uh, there is a decision made by the, uh, the borough president, the, I always get this slightly wrong, so you'll have to bear with me, the borough president, the Department of City Planning, uh, the City Council, and finally the mayor. Most times the, the process is initiated for the rezoning of a district because the mayor wants it, whoever the mayor is. Uh, so by the time the Euler process gets through the City Council, it's not problematic anymore. The mayor is usually going to accept it and the, the rezoning will be a done deal, as we say. In this case, uh, as in some other cases of neighborhood rezonings, there was a lawsuit against the rezoning that was filed during the Euler process. That lawsuit did not succeed. There is at least one lawsuit that has been filed since the rezoning was completed in December 2021, and that lawsuit is continuing. That lawsuit has not been finished yet. So I could just stop now because this is, this is, you know, this is a very complicated context, even though I'm only talking about the rezoning of uh, one district. Let me go back to review some of the history of zoning that's relevant to the, the conflicts. Um, for at least a 20 year period, the future of SOHO was uncertain. Um, there was a plan that some of you may have read about that was identified with the urban, the public sector urban planner Robert Moses in the 1950s, a plan to build a, an expressway that would link New Jersey over here with Long Island over here. This, is, uh, this, this would be north to the left and south to the, to the right. Um, and this, uh, this east-west expressway uh, was uh, strongly promoted by Robert Moses but some of you may also know that it was fought by activists associated with Jane Jacobs, and they managed to defeat the, uh, the plan for the expressway. Nonetheless, there was this long period, actually from 1928, from when the idea for such an expressway was first proposed, not by Robert Moses, but 1928, to the 1970s when the plan to build this highway was definitively defeated. But you can see from this illustration that it decisively would have cut uh, the southern tip of Manhattan over here, which includes Wall Street, from everything to the north. This is uh, Soho here and Greenwich Village a little farther here. Um, by the time the German photographer Thomas Struth made uh, some very well-known photographs in Soho in the late 1970s, this long era of uncertainty had ended because it was sure that the highway would not be built, but nobody knew what was going to happen. Uh, yeah. Already by this point, the point of the photograph, uh, the point when the photograph was taken, Already, uh, there was a historic district designation and there was zoning in favor of artists 
joint live work quarters so they could live and work legally in lofts in Soho, but nobody really knew what was going to happen. Nobody, nobody understood. <laughs> nobody had a crystal ball, so nobody could predict the future that Soho would become an artist district, though never with any kind of legal designation as an artist district, not for the district as a whole. So Soho today has been uh, kept as a, a very coherent uh, architectural ensemble, but it, the, the storefront spaces are filled with stores and restaurants. And a lot of the living lofts are uh, live work lofts for artists, but also very luxurious incredibly expensive lofts that have been bought by, illegally uh, by uh, celebrities, by David, uh, David Bowie and his wife, uh, for example, lived in, uh, in, in Soho, um, uh, bought by uh, famous artists, uh, bought by people who uh, earn a lot of money working in tech, people who earn a lot of money working in finance, people who earn a lot of money working uh, as, as lawyers or other kinds of, of uh, professionals. Nonetheless, there are still a lot of working artists, musicians, dancers, writers, um, editors, curators living in Soho. And you, you can you can see that even the business improvement district likes to likes to note that Robert Moses lost his his plan to tear down um, a large part of Soho. So if if I put together the research that I did for uh, for my book Loft Living, together with uh, what 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 we know now. Uh, 40 years later, we can say that under de uh, under development or uh, uh, wasted development saved Soho and all of the public and private disinvestment that goes along with uh, the obsolescence of a manufacturing area. Also saved, uh, which I wrote about a great deal in in loft living uh, by. Uh, the gradual recognition by um, public officials that art could be a driver of economic growth. Maybe they weren't thinking so much of individual artists, but they were thinking about uh, uh, the, the original version of uh, the creative city concept before there was a term creative city they were gra they were uh, officials were gradually thinking hey yeah you know maybe if we have people coming to see art and visit artist studios and go to art galleries maybe we could get some economic growth out of that and so uh, both the local and state and national governments began to support artists along with higher education in general, so that many artists were able to use the grants that the gov government was giving for the first time for all kinds of artistic production to rent or buy lofts. The other important kind of government support for artists was, as I suggest, zoning that enabled them to live either as renters or owners of lofts to live legally in what was still a manufacturing zone, or I should say a zone in which manufacturing had the legal priority. And then the historic preservation laws enabled Soho to be saved as this very coherent, quite beautiful ensemble of buildings. Maybe each individual building is not beautiful in itself, but together the coherence of the district is, is very attractive and you know connects people to the industrial past of the city. What also saved Soho though, which I did not write about in Loft Living, was that a number of artists, a large number of artists were able to buy their lofts and to create cooperative ownership 
of the buildings where they live. I have to say that co-ops in New York are a legal form of ownership, kind of outpaced by condos in recent years, but they have nothing to do with socialist ideals or sharing or uh, limitations on making a profit from selling your apartment. And as I'm trying to suggest, uh, something that saved Soho also condemned Soho to be upscaled, gentrified, and affluent. And that is that over the years, as artists moved out of Soho for many reasons, they sold their lofts at market rates, which got higher every year and brought people who were not artists because artists could not pay $1 million, $2 million, $10 million for, for a loft, but people who work in tech and finance and celebrities could pay those prices. So just to, you know, just to fill in on this architectural coherence mm -hmm. as a um, as a, uh, a spur to redevelopment. This is a picture of one of my favorite buildings, if not absolute favorite building in New York City, the Hogwalt building on Broadway in Soho, as it looked a long time ago and as it looks now. This is actually the building in which the Otis Elevator Company installed the very first passenger elevator in um, in New York City and maybe in, in the world. So it's a building with, with historic as well as architectural significance. Um, but commercial redevelopment was has also been very important in Soho's changing character. Uh, these are three artists. This was Gordon Matta Clark, who unfortunately died at an early age, a very well, well known um, conceptual artist. And you can see that uh, they were also gentrifiers in their time period because they, uh, like other restaurant owners, uh, took over the lease of this uh, uh, Latino restaurant that served uh, factory workers in, in the area. And in this space, they, can, they created a conceptualist restaurant, which got a lot of media attention in the early 1970s. And um, became uh, you know very well known as a as a sign of what we call we academics call artist led gentrification. Uh, the conceptualist restaurant was called food. And in my interviews, I have interviewed at least two artists who cooked there in the 1970s. So by 2010, um, the cobblestone streets of this uh, historic district were accompanied by a huge number of luxury stores, transnational boutiques, which may or may not make a lot of sales, but they attract a lot of interest and they function as advertisements for all the many visitors to Soho who you know, are who become familiar with the, the various brands by seeing their, their storefronts and their signs. The legal framework, as I've tried to suggest, is very complicated, pretty complicated. Basically, uh, the land and buildings are privately owned. There's practically no publicly owned, uh, state owned land in or buildings in Soho and uh, no uh, subsidized, no publicly subsidized housing. Uh, the zoning laws that enabled artists to live and work legally in Soho's lofts, nonetheless gave priority to manufacturers to stay in or rent the storefronts and the basement. Uh, of, of buildings. Consequently, every store and every restaurant that has opened in Soho since 1971 has had to go through the process, the Euler process of to get a variance, an exception from the zoning law because it's not a manufacturing use of the space. In other words, that zoning, those zoning laws have never been changed. Uh, they were not 
changed until December 2021. Mm -hmm. I also mentioned the historic preservation laws. There's a series of these laws that protect uh, the center of Soho and um, adjacent parts of Soho, as well as NoHo. Um, there are some lofts, some rental lofts are under rent stabilization, according to a law that was adopted by the New York City Council in 1982, but not all rental lofts are rent stabilized because the owner of a building must agree to go through the procedure and agree to having all of the lofts or some of the lofts as it happens in their building um, rent stabilized. So not every yeah. building owner wants to do that. Most of the loft co-ops uh, and uh, I should say all of the loft co-ops and most of the new condos that have been built as ex zoning exceptions in Soho are um, owner occupied or at least they're privately owned and they are rented out, not necessarily as Airbnbs, but rented on a, let's say yearly basis for very high rents. Uh, this area, Soho and also NoHo is filled with extremely expensive housing. And um, if you were looking to rent a loft in Soho, you would be looking at a very high rent that might start at, well, I was going to say $5,000 a month, but now that has become the post-pandemic um, average rent in Manhattan, 5,000 US dollars a month. But uh, lofts in Soho might cost Ten or twenty thousand dollars a month and uh, and up. So that by the nineteen nineties uh, and definitely the two thousand early two thousands, Soho had become what uh, a residential area would be described as super gentrified. Many art galleries by the mid 1990s, not all, but many art galleries moved out. A lot of them moved to uh, uh, the neighborhood called Chelsea, farther north. Uh, what was moving in was fast fashion stores like Uniqlo uh, and H&M and transnational designer boutiques like Prada, uh, Christian Dior, Yves Saint Laurent, uh, Louis Vuitton, and all the many others uh, <laughs> you know, whose names are too numerous to mention. Also, streetwear stores uh, whose uh, products are not cheap, but um, very, very fashionable and often uh, are produced in uh, collaboration with uh, um, high fashion designers. A lot of artist residents had moved out over the years, even though, as I said, 8,000, around 8,000 artists remain living in Soho. Um, uh, artists moved out for various reasons. Some of them moved out for life cycle reasons. Some moved out because they got teaching jobs in other parts of the country or the world. Some had come from overseas and went back to their countries uh, of origin. Uh, some of them became uh, rich and moved to their country houses near New York, um, uh, you know, for the same reasons any other residents move, move out, many artists moved out over the years. So that by the time rezoning was being talked about in 2015, the housing activists from the YIMBY people from outside of Soho we're talking about Soho as a rich white neighborhood. And that was not incorrect. The pandemic, however, brought another vortex of uncertainty. The rents, especially the commercial rents had risen so high, there were already a lot of vacancies in Soho on the ground floor. Um, the street artists try to you know, resurrect a, a better reputation for Soho, but it was just a really expensive place and nobody knew what was going to happen. However, uh, as we like to say in New York City, Soho came back 
and uh, there, uh, you know, there are still a lot of tourists visiting and taking pictures. Um, obviously, this is not as pretty a sight as the uh, 19th century building I showed you before, but I, I find this really photogenic. I took this picture a few weeks ago, and uh, there are a lot of tourists coming to Soho. Here, people are waiting to enter a new, fairly new establishment. This is an establishment that calls itself a museum, but it's really a, a kind of experiential play and retail space based on the product called slime. And um, you can see that the Department of City Planning, when it talks about preserving space in, in Soho for museums, they're really thinking about this kind of uh, tourist attraction, the Museum of Slime. Uh, a couple of blocks away, also on Broadway, there's a so-called Museum of Ice Cream. And a Museum of Women is also scheduled to open on Broadway. Um, I just ask you to think about this in terms of what the artists who live in Soho want the area to become again. So as I have suggested, there are these massive zoning contradictions that the Department of City Planning said they were going to rationalize and modernize in 20, 20, by 2021. Uh, here, for example, is a notification of a public hearing required by the Euler process for a store to open at this address because the zoning does not permit a store to be there, even though st a store has been there for, I don't know how many years, but because it's, it, it was an exception to the zoning laws, there had to be pu public hearings, votes, and so on. Oops, sorry. And also, uh, this is a, an example of a certificate of occupancy that shows what a building can legally be used for. This is a certificate of occupancy for a building in Soho that the, the street name is misspelled. There's actually an E on green. This building um, sold for $10 million after the rezoning was passed. Um, I can talk about that later, but this particular uh, building site is too small to qualify for affordable housing. So I don't know what the new owner has in mind for this building. Uh, the legal, the only legal use of the building though is joint living work quarters for artists. And I have to point out that a further complication to the zoning laws is that the way the zoning laws were written in 1971 was that you could not live in these lofts legally if you were just any old artist, or if you said you were an artist, you had to be certified as an artist by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. And that was kind of an involved procedure because you had to show that you were exhibiting your work or you were selling your work and not every artist who lived in or wanted to live in a loft in Soho was lucky enough to be exhibiting or even luckier to be selling their their work. I, I, I'll come back to that later. So when the Department of City Planning said they wanted to modernize, they had certain things in mind. Um, given that they were facing a housing crisis, they wanted to permit real estate developers to build tall buildings, even in a historic landmark district, without going through any kind of special approval process, like a ULERP process. Because the de Blasio administration um, was committed to socially progressive policies, they uh, devised between 2013 and 2020, during de Blasio's two terms as mayor, they devised a zoning tool called mandatory inclusionary housing, which requires 
real estate developers to include a large number, well, or a small number, depending on your point of view, 25 to 30% of new apartments in any rental apartment project that they built to have affordable rents. Um, the, the, uh, the norms governing affordability are very complicated and deserve another lecture on their own. I can't go into that now, but basically the affordable housing rates are set by um, nationally devised formulas and um, not every low income family would qualify to get one of these affordable apartments. Nonetheless, not enough affordable apartments are built under mandatory inclusionary housing so that tens of thousands of people usually enter a lottery to have a chance to get one out of maybe 100 new apartments that would be built in a single project. Sorry to <laughs> sorry to be obscure. I hope I'm I'm being reasonably clear. Um, the rezoning that the Department of City Planning proposed uh, also uh, tried to mollify residents who were complaining about the trash and the nighttime deliveries of big stores and the noise and trash of restaurants and bars. So they said, oh, don't worry if a big store larger than the zoning uh, will, uh, the, that the zoning allows wants to open, we will ask them to get a special permit. Um, residents are uh, not sure how stringent a permission require a permission process will be. Uh, the Department of City Planning uh, also said, okay, we know that a lot of non-artists are living in lofts. And we also know that a lot, some of these buildings that have been legalized with certificates of occupancy for artists residency, they're not really, le they're not really legally good for housing because they are fire hazards, because they don't have windows in every bedroom, because the bathrooms are not ventilated. So we're going to require everybody who lives in a loft to go through all the legal procedures of renovation, which could be quite an expensive proposition that the elderly artists who are living in Soho are not prepared to pay for and cannot pay for. They also demand it as a way of either penalizing or mollifying the artists living in Soho that artists pay a very hefty renovation fee to an arts fund that the city did not define. They said that the arts fund would benefit arts organizations uh, uh, in lower Manhattan, but they never explained, this, the, the Department of City Planning and the Department of Cultural Affairs never explained how an arts fund would benefit Soho or the possibility of subsidizing per, um, performance and a production space for artists in Soho. The local community board during its initial stage of the Euler process voted against the rezoning almost unanimously. There was only one vote out of say 50 votes that favored the rezoning. And many, many people, most of the people living in Soho, artists as well as tech and financial people opposed the rezoning for one reason or another. The local pre historic preservation organization uh, you know, made this really nice cartoon where they indicated that this rezoning is really going to benefit real estate developers under the guise of building affordable housing and benefit the mayor 
and his um, and the real estate developers who uh, who uh, donated to his various campaigns. So here I come along as a researcher, and I do have strong opinions about the rezoning that I'm trying not to not to uh, share with you uh, right now, but uh, I um, I ask the same question that any of us researchers would ask, well, who is speaking for the community and whose community is it? The res you know, the residents who include owners and renters who were protesting the, the rezoning, you know, borrow this phrase from the late civil rights activist and member of, of, uh, of Congress, John Lewis, uh, and their picture reminds us of you know what it was what it was like in the 1970s when artists were pressing for the right to live and work legally in in Soho. But um, this is a you know this is maybe not the a reflection of the whole situation. And by the way, I don't know if you can see this. I can't get rid of my my talking sign here, but the original name of the community activists opposition, ad hoc opposition group to the rezoning was save Soho and NoHo. But when they realized that they really should include the Chinese residents of those areas to the east and uh, uh, to the east of Soho, who were likely to be um, evicted, displaced, and you know uh, otherwise uh, really inconvenienced by uh, the rezoning, they, underneath this, this talking Sharon Zubin sign, you can see that they put a Chinese translation of the, of the website in gear. But if you look on Street Easy, a, uh, a, a popular website that advertises, uh, gives a lot of information about buildings in New York City and advertises um, rentals and, and sales, uh, the lofts are quite expensive. Even this, even this one, which is not fixed up to luxury standards, that is, it does not have a lot pool, a swimming pool on a deck outside. It does not have designer bookshelves and fancy uh, appliances. Even this one uh, was sold for four million dollars, which is quite, you know, uh, quite a lot of money. So, whom to blame? for the loss of Soho, who lost Soho. Uh, should we blame artist privilege, those artists who used their grants or used a loan from their, their families to buy lofts for maybe $35,000 back in the 1970s? They're still thinking that their loft looks like this. This is a photo of my friend Kay's loft uh, when she moved in around 1970. So when people talk about artist privilege and um, you know how privileged they are to live in, in Soho, the artists are thinking back to their youth when they used their sweat equity and maybe their, their government arts grants to buy their, their spaces. And some of them have managed to keep the maintenance of the monthly maintenance payments of their buildings fairly low. So the artists do not see themselves as a privileged group. And the artists, you know, have um, uh, left of center political views. Uh, uh, some of them were and still are uh, feminists, uh, activists uh, for uh, you know, various forms of marginalization. The, it's an interesting question whether renters, though, have as much privilege as owners, because renters are bound to be uh, bound to be, uh, at the very least, harassed by the owners of their building who can get much higher rents uh, if if uh, they add some floors to buildings or sell the building to uh, you know as as. Uh, as condos or do something that the rezoning permits them to do. Uh, also up for blame though, is the, uh, the city government for the city administration 
for never enforcing the zoning laws so that people everywhere knew that artists were selling spaces, loft spaces to non-artists, but the city didn't stop them from doing that. Selling to non-artists went along with uh, bringing rent, pro rents and property values up to uh, levels that are unaffordable by creative producers. Also, as I said a few minutes ago, uh, by the, the mid-1980s, the Department of Cultural Affairs was no longer paying attention to artist certification so that anyone could move into an artist loft or any other loft in Soho. Also by the 19, probably the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, and definitely by the mid 1990s, uh, Department of City Planning people were well aware that shopping was a potent force for economic growth. And as I suggested when I showed you the map, the rezoning map at the very beginning of my talk, this, the public officials and the city planning department are very well aware that tech offices and financial offices, including venture capitalists offices that are already located in Soho are a potent form of, uh, of new economic growth. Of course, I wrote about that in my last book, The Innovation Complex, but here it comes back to become influential on this research on Soho. And most painfully, uh, there's an interesting question about the continuing value of historic preservation to public officials. The, uh, the city planning department lead person on the rezoning said at one of the public meetings that I watched on Zoom that historic preservation is not as important as building affordable housing. And honestly, the younger generation feels that way too. So, I'm, I'm left with the question, will this upzoning really solve the housing crisis? Uh, will the rent gap that Neil Smith wrote about years ago incentivize landlords to evict their rent stabilized tenants, whether those tenants are living in uh, uh, apartments or, uh, or lofts in and around Soho? What about the loopholes, which would require another half hour lecture on their own, but there are loopholes, as I suggested when I showed you the certificate of occupancy for the building on Green Street that sold for $10 million after the rezoning. One of the loopholes in mandatory inclusionary housing is that some buildings are too small to qualify for that inclusionary housing. Also, if a real estate developer or building owner does not want to build rental apartments, but wants to build owner occupied apartments, this mandatory inclusionary housing does not apply. So a building site in Soho might generate uh, 20 or, or 100 of uh, luxury condos with no affordable housing. Another final loophole that I'll mention is that um, if a real estate developer or building owner wants to devote a certain amount of space to offices or other commercial uses and the rest to residences, the amount of offices will determine whether mandatory inclusionary housing comes into play. So that building in which let's say half the, the floors are going to be in commercial use may not even qualify for mandatory inclusionary housing. So there are a lot of loopholes and the, um, the community activists who opposed rezoning are well aware of that. Another question is, can there be too much luxury housing? Is it, is it just insane to put more luxury units 
into an, an area that is already filled with expensive apartments? Or isn't it worth it to create a few thousand expensive luxury apartments as long as you get a few hundred affordable apartments. And isn't it worth it is really a quote from people whom I've talked to about, uh, about the Soho rezoning who say, well, it, isn't it worth it to create all of those luxury units as long as we get some affordable units? You know whether you think that's throwing crumbs to crumbs to crumbs to the needy or um, making a valuable contribution to the house to solving the housing crisis is a good question. And then I leave you with these final questions: What is the economic value of the arts in big cities going forward? What is the social value of preserving the architecture? of historical memory? And what are the right mechanisms for community empowerment? Is it some form of community control, which the community boards would like to have? Is it something on a larger scale, some kind of comprehensive planning that the community board in Soho is afraid will be dominated by the um, uh, the the city council and dominated by the real estate industry, which has dominated rezonings up till now. So this is what I've been working on, and I'm very eager to hear your questions and your and your and your comments. Um, it's a really <laughs> it's a relatively small area of the city, and Maybe it's an area that looks very privileged, but there are a whole lot of complicated questions here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we have about five minutes for Q&A. For those of you who join us online, you can post your question in the, in the Q&A box. So I will read it out to the audience in the room. Okay, well, give it go. Maybe I can I can uh, ask the first question uh, using the power of the of the chair. Um, so, so Sharon, you mentioned a lot about this zoning rezoning. I just wonder whether is there a public value capture mechanism in New York City, so the city, the public sector actually can benefit from this rezoning re process. Excuse me, are you asking who is benefiting from the rezoning process? Uh, I was asking about the public value capture. Oh. Well, well it, I, I really don't know what the public value capture is, is going to be. Uh, remember, I'm not an urban planner, so that's not that's a phrase that is not in my active vocabulary. Um, it's it's really, you know, it's just a really difficult situation uh, to to analyze rationally. Um, the 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 benefit, the, the you know the, the 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 public value seems to be around 300 apartments that will be whose rents will be set below the market level. And as I as I said, there are various formulas that are used to to set those rents. The city does not control those formulas. Um, it's the federal government, the national government that controls those formulas. Uh, but there are so many loopholes that it's not clear how many apartments will be built or um, who will get those those apartments. Uh, another, you know, another form of, uh, you know, a, a, another kind of question about, about public value is um how are people who's with low incomes going to live in this area of the city where there are no inexpensive places to buy groceries 
there are no schools or parks in this area. There is no, there is one asphalt covered playground. In other words, this is, this is a residential, it's a mixed use area and people are willing to live there, but it's a hard place to live. It's not a typical residential area, the way you might think of a typical residential area. And it's a densely built area already. You know, one of the, one of the demands of the, of the community activists who live in Soho and oppose the rezoning was um, to try to convert some of these loft buildings that were emptied by the pandemic because they were office buildings to convert them to housing to, that, would, that would include or be completely subsidized housing. But the problem is that those buildings are privately owned and the city government, number one, was not going to use the power of eminent domain to try to take control ownership of those buildings or take control of those buildings for the public benefit. Number two, um, the city government is determined not to spend direct subsidy money, not to spend any capital on building housing. This way, with mandatory inclusionary housing, real estate, private real estate developers do all of the building. They take all of the risks. The city government merely requires them to include a certain percentage of affordable apartments. It's, you know, there are more complications about public benefits that involve homeless shelters that I, that I don't want to get into right now, but that's another thorny set of issues that involves uh, Soho and also Chinatown. Yep. Yeah. So um, Sharon, we have two questions from the audience. Um, maybe two quick, I'll read it quite quickly and maybe two quick answers here as well. Uh, first question is, um, why isn't housing for the poor a priority? And second question is, um, I'm wondering, is there any criteria or methodologies you have developed to measure the success of rezoning or new development as compared to the, uh, the standard measures? So how to measure quality rather than quantity? So two questions and two quick answers. Thank you. Okay, uh, second one first. Just as I am not an expert on urban planning, I am not a housing expert. You know, I'm, 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 you know kind of, uh, kind of uh, just a person who walks around and you know thinks of questions um, about about cities. Um, so uh, I don't have I don't have any methodology, uh, but I can tell you that out of uh, you know like 200 rezonings that have been uh, uh, put into play by the city government since the early 2000s by two different mayors, Bloomberg and de Blasio, there, have been, there has been a huge amount of opposition by residents, whether those residents are high income or low income. Most of the rezoning, well, actually there have been rezonings in every income level uh, neighborhood, but Every uh, you know, a, a lot of these these rezonings have been bitterly opposed by uh, by residents. So it's not only artists, it's not only uh, affluent people. It's you know, a lot of people who who uh, are really really resentful of the way the city government has uh, railroaded, has pushed through rezonings uh, without paying enough attention to the benefits that the residents demand. And, you know, the, the residents use the Euler process, the, that graduated, that geographically graduated approval process to try to press the city government for benefits. Um, in, in the case of, uh, of uh, um, East New York, which is a low income, um, predominantly black and, and Latino and immigrant area of, of Brooklyn, those residents asked for certain kinds of um, manufacturing uh, facilities to be modernized and training facilities for manufacturing jobs. 
um, in, in the Soho case, the artist said, we understand that there is a housing crisis and people need affordable housing, but we don't want to lose the historic district. And um, uh, we, we don't want to have the addition of more big stores and more, many more luxury apartments. Uh, yes, why isn't there a priority for poor people's housing? In theory, there is, period. In theory, in theory, there is. But who's going to build it? The city depends on real estate developers. And real estate developers do what they call penciling it out. And what they, you know, what they agreed to, to do is to include this 30%, 25 to 30% of affordable units, maybe, maybe, not guaranteed. Great, thank you. Um, I'm a bit concerned of the time, so I'm going to call an end to this um, public lecture. Um, thank you very much. We do have two more questions, or three more questions from the audience. So I might email them to you directly, if, if that's all right. And um, hopefully um, I can somehow post these answers to the, um, to the, to the website or, or directly to the audience. Okay, um, thank you again for the great lecture and thank you. Thank you.